and just to introduce our speakers today, so we have Jan Sasens, who's going to be our speaker. Um, and Jan is the head of digital finance unit in the Directorate General for Financial Stability, Financial Services, and Capital Markets Union. We also have Michael Concanon from the BPFI, who focuses on fintech and payments. Kevin O'Neill from Fenergo, who is head of uh, the sales focus for Fenergo in asset management and asset servicing. And Ruth McCarthy, the CEO of Flexco Corporate Payments. So we've got great speakers and great panel uh, lined up for you today. Um, as I said, the focus of this session is on the um, future of uh, fintech, and I think just to maybe tee it up very quickly, just to say that you know the impact of COVID-19 has been pretty profound in terms of our world. It's uh, had some very profound implications. Overnight, for banks, their customers have effectively moved in instantly almost to engaging digitally, uh, something that banks expected to take many years uh, to happen. Cash usage, ATM usage, branch usage has dropped away pretty dramatically and banks, because of the economic implication of COVID-19, are facing some pretty significant uh, implications around cost. So I think being able to respond in an agile way, in a way that focuses on customer experience and leverages good kind of technology should play well for fintechs. And I think what we want to explore today is what is the impact of this new world, I guess, that we're facing into on the future of fintechs. So we will do that in a moment with our panel, Ruth, Kevin and Michael. Um, but first, it's uh, a great pleasure in introducing Jan, who is going to give a keynote um, and share, I guess, some of the uh, future intentions that the European Commission has around the topic of digital finance. So Jan, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm just going to hand over directly to you. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brian and, and David, uh, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, uh, everybody from uh, from Brussels. I hope you can you can hear me. Um, and then I will simply assume that is that is the case. Um, so thank you very much indeed for putting this uh, this uh, important topic on the on the agenda. Now here in Brussels uh, these days, of course, uh, the the main talk is indeed around let's say the recovery. Plan and the uh, the new multilateral financial framework, um, and uh, uh, I however see a close link of this actually to our discussion today. So when we from the Commission we presented Mrs. von der Leyen, our president presented uh, some weeks ago actually the the EU's uh, recovery strategy. Uh, in the preparations, I think there was uh, uh, one moment where, where people were thinking, well, what does this mean actually for, for the digital agenda? What does this mean for, 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 for tech? Will this now go on the back burner? Will all the efforts actually move into, uh, let's say, uh, repairing the economic damage? And I think uh, when you look at uh, the proposals which the European Commission made actually for the recovery of Europe, uh, and also the distribution, the suggested distribution of, uh, of resources which will be available, you can see that we very quickly actually uh, decided that we, know we need to go to a different direction. We cannot, our objective cannot be just to go back to the status quo uh, which, as it was before. We need to actually use this uh, this situation, this uh, this huge challenge, uh, as an opportunity to to accelerate actually on the on the digital agenda, on on uh, on making Europe fit for the digital age, and and that's very decisively and very strongly actually the uh, the direction of travel which we are proposing from the European Commission. So not uh, going back again to where we were before, but actually using the acceleration which indeed uh, COVID and the the lockdown has has brought for for digitalization as an opportunity for for Europe. And uh, I think that's really what it is also in the financial sector. Uh, I mean, of course, I and probably all of you have been using uh, digital banking for a long time. But now, indeed, I think uh, also the generation of our parents and grandparents uh, actually are, are uh, online for their banking. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, this is actually a big opportunity for, for Europe and also for the financial sector in Europe to, uh, to get uh, on top of those, uh, of those things. Um, now, of course, the lockdown is, is the, uh, the confinement is slowly uh, over. And in that sense, people, if they want, can also go back to uh, physical contacts. And uh, while I think the beer I want to share with my friends, uh, I will long, be longing very much to do that uh, in real life and not just via, via Zoom. I think when it comes to finance, there, there's a hope and opportunity actually to keep many people, many more people digital than they were before. Um, of course, the Europeans are, I think they've gotten used to this. But they're not, they're not naive. So basically, if they see that digital means uh, uh, risks for them, means stronger risks for them, 
uh, then they will not uh, they will not go for it. Uh, so they will go for digital and they will stay digital even if they are not uh, it's not essential anymore. They will stay digital if they think it will support actually their their life. It will uh, be beneficial for them uh, and it will not be linked to to additional risks. Uh, in that sense, very much I think from the European Commission. Our uh, our objectives and our uh, let's say uh, uh, let's say scope is to use the opportunities of the digital age for 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 everyone um, to make sure that uh, digitalization actually uh, works for the uh, uh, the values uh, which which we have a technology working for the people for the economic recovery also for an open and democratic society and I think there are many elements there maybe outside of the financial sector and the digital uh, age which are very important. And of course, also last but not least, uh, also to strengthen Europe as a global player. Uh, also, that is, I think, is an important, uh, an important area in this uh, in this context. Um, now, uh, those are many opportunities, but of course, the risks also need to be kept in check. Uh, digital finance is still finance, and that means that uh, finance is uh, inherently a risky business. That is why we are regulating and supervising it. And that regulation and supervision vision, of course, needs to happen as effectively in the digital age than in the, uh, in, uh, in the past decades. Um, one thing is clear about the digital age. The, the digital age is European and global. It is not something which can stop at the borders. No country in Europe, not even Germany or France, have the scale actually uh, to develop proper uh, world-leading fin fintech solutions or digital solutions. Uh, and in that sense, we need to leverage and build very much on the European internal market uh, actually to develop uh, uh, digital. Um, when we have been in touch over the past three months with uh, many stakeholders in our digital finance outreach actually across Europe, including in Dublin, uh, we have heard from all member states that really any fintech, no fintech is basically developing, almost no is developing solutions just for their home market. They're all looking at the scaling up at the European market as a whole. Um, so I think that's very important and that also shows that uh, there's a lot of support. That's what we also heard when speaking to stakeholders indeed for Europe to take uh, a leading role to make clear that there are rules in place which are the same across uh, Europe uh, and, uh, and uh, that this is really a single market, an internal market where you can scale up. Uh, we can build on quite something. I think FinTech, to just give just one number, is the number one uh, venture capital, uh, let's say, sector in, in, in Europe. So there's no other innovative sector where more uh, uh, venture capital uh, uh, comes into than in the fintech sector. And uh, as you know, in uh, uh, with PSD2, we have, I think, one of the world leading regulatory frameworks for, for digital payments, which are indeed one of the spearheads of, uh, of, uh, of digital finance. Um, so we want to build on that very much. We also, let's say, have some had some good initiatives in the European uh, the European level already in the past years based on a fintech action plan. Actually, we have, uh, for example, uh, established a, a, a regulatory framework for crowdfunding. We have asked experts. Experts have reported to us what are the regulatory obstacles to financial innovation, and on that basis, we are now actually working very hard to put uh, uh, to put forward still in September a new uh, strategy for digital finance for fintech uh, actually to uh, to develop and flourish in uh, in, uh, in Europe and to make sure that Europe actually has a leading role globally and retains a leading role globally in this in this area um, fintech uh, is not only financial it's also tech and in that sense uh, arguably the uh, lines between the financial sector and other sectors are blurring more and more so that is also something we are strongly recognizing uh, in Brussels and the, from the European Commission. Uh, so we are, as you know, building also a broader cross-sectional framework for key trends, for artificial, in, artificial intelligence, for data, a European data strategy, for e-identities and for digital services uh, provision. And uh, we will uh, look at the fintech aspect of this very much in connection, or we're looking at it very much in connection with our our colleagues uh, and uh, try to make sure that as many as, as possible of those issues are actually addressed across sectors, across the board. But of course, as uh, we all know, uh, tech is, uh, fintech is still, uh, and the financial sector are still special, so we will also need to see and to uh, consider what adjustments are needed, particularly in the, in the financial sector. And from our side, we are looking at three I think key areas which on which we really want to make uh, we want to make sure that Europe can uh, and this Commission also can make a difference over the past four or five years of its mandate. 
Now, the first one of this is indeed to uh, further enable firms scaling up in the across the single market. I did mention in the beginning that this is probably a key benefit, uh, and uh, the single market is probably is, is essential, is indispensable actually for fintech to even to work in Europe. Um, and so we want, uh, we are of course aware that there's still a number of hurdles, even though we have uh, uh, say much, already much achieved. Uh, regulatory divergencies, for example, on remote identification (KYC) uh, are still a key a key issue. Uh, the lack of passporting in some areas, uh, for example, on crypto assets or others. Um, and also, let's say, the lack of uh, being able to do cross-border testing, cross-border engagement with authorities on a broader, in a broader manner. So th that's really something which, from our side, needs to be actually built on and, and developed much, much uh, stronger. All, all the, the barriers uh, which they are still to scale up from one uh, member state to the next. Now, the second, I think, big priority we're seeing is indeed to adapt our regulation to make it uh, both technology neutral and innovation, innovation friendly. And I think uh, one of the areas which we identified where uh, indeed, uh, let's say, some adjustments are necessary uh, are uh, the area of uh, DLT and crypto assets. Uh, we, we do think that this is an area where regulation would actually be beneficial because today there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, if we remove that regulatory uncertainty, that can actually, the market can grow so we can uh, actually regulate to enable this market to, uh, to, to develop and use all the opportunities. And we'll make uh, proposals on that actually also quite soon in, in September. Now, the third area uh, we are looking at and we want to promote is indeed data-driven financial services. Uh, it is clear whether you look at AI, whether you look at the next uh, uh, generation of technologies, all of those will in the future rely on data. Um, I think in the financial sector and the, uh, in the European uh, regulatory framework, we are only making actually available quite a lot of data and a lot of innovations can be built on them. Uh, I have not counted actually the amount of public disclosure requirements in our legislation. You probably know them and maybe you sometimes hate them in your specific areas. Uh, but indeed, all of this is data uh, on which innovation, data-driven innovation can be built. I think we need to work a bit more uh, to make sure that this data uh, is also actually can uh, is made available and can be used in machine readable formats and in formats that it can really feed right to innovation rather than being available on PDFs or other uh, or other a bit more difficult uh, uh, formats. Uh, so that's definitely something we will look at. We will also look uh, indeed at uh, further developing open banking, open finance. Uh, we do think that this is something which uh, which is uh, uh, very uh, essential and uh, supportive of uh, of innovation and finance and actually necessary. Um, it's an interesting discussion because indeed it also links again, let's say, uh, data in in finance with also data available in other sectors of the economy. And if you want to develop develop innovative financial products, it is useful actually to do exactly that combination. So again. We are working on this very strongly with our colleagues in other parts of the Commission, which are looking at platform regulation, which are looking at, uh, at, at the energy markets, uh, at uh, geographical data and other matters, indeed to make sure uh, that innovators have access to the data actually they need to, uh, to, to develop their, their innovations. Um, last but not least, uh, uh, the risks, we cannot and must not forget of, uh, about them. I think our objective is really to, to enable digital finance. Uh, but that will not happen if people have the impression that this digital finance is more risky than, than, than other finance. In that sense, one of the key things we need to look at is indeed the digital operational resilience of the financial system, the resilience against cyber risks, also, uh, let's say, uh, the arrangements uh, for the use of third-party tech providers and how risks are managed in that context. Uh, all of those are matters on, a thing on which I think many firms have made a lot of progress. But our system and our kind of firewalls will be only as strong as the weakest link because everybody in today's uh, economy is connected to each other. And in that sense, it is important that we have a baseline of requ requirements uh, to make sure that all participants in the financial sector actually keep these risks in check. Uh, I think we're also looking at other risks and how they are developing and changing in the, in the digital environment. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly changing in terms of uh, value chains uh, being kind of uh, uh, broken, sliced and diced, uh, also uh, uh, changing risks in terms of new operators coming into the financial system, large tech companies. So I think those are also risk issues which we need to look at and just see, does our supervisory system still actually, is it still uh, capable of, of dealing with those matters or do we need to maybe adjust it? 
Um, but uh, all of this, I think, is, is important and key indeed with a key objective in mind to actually promote and enhance this digital transformation of the, uh, of the financial sector. I'm very happy that in Ireland there are many fintechs and many large firms and uh, many, many players who are, who are very interested uh, uh, to, and who are actually at the forefront of, uh, of this uh, development. That's what we already heard when uh, our Director General Sean Berrigan had an outreach event in, in Ireland actually a couple of weeks or months ago. I'm very pleased to discuss these things today with you and we're looking forward really also to hear from you where it is that Europe can still help actually to, uh, to, to facilitate this, uh, this issue and to make sure that, that you can actually seize this opportunity which indeed uh, COVID-19 and the digital acceleration around it has uh, have brought. Thank you very much. Jan, thank you very much for that. Some uh, a lot of a lot of ground covered there. Some really interesting points and perspectives, and um, I think we we'll certainly explore those as we move into the panel section of the event now. So I might just ask the uh, other panel members to join me uh, on screen, and uh, just while they're doing that, um, just to say to anybody who wants to ask a question of Jan or of any of the panel members please use the question box that should be uh, on your screen. Just use that to kind of submit a question. I will try and leave time at the end to uh, pick up audience questions uh, towards the end. So please uh, do, do ask questions if you, if you feel there's something that you want to, to ask. Okay, so let me maybe just start off with um, maybe Ruth. I might start with you if that's okay. So um, I think uh, the, the impact of COVID-19, as is mentioning, is kind of, you know, being pretty profound kind of a real focus around digital first but I just wonder from your perspective from a fintech's perspective you know is the impact of COVID-19 is it positive or are there some negative implications of what's happened uh, you know as a consequence of COVID-19? Well from a FEXCO perspective um, COVID-19 had an immediate and significant impact on our business because as a fintech we've developed in a lot of different markets but we developed off our core competence which is focused on travel and payments associated with travel so obviously when travel stops that has, has a very severe impact on what we do and I think that highlights um, a risk for fintechs so there's been a positive in the sense that fintechs are digital first and the response to COVID-19 has been very digital however fintechs tend to be in particular niches rather than being spread across a wide, diff a wide array of, of products and sectors. So if you're in a sector that's been very badly affected by COVID, um, your fintech is going to be suffering equally. And that is a challenge, especially for newer businesses. It's another point that Jan raised about the fact that there has been a large amount of venture capital investment into fintechs. Um, we just need to be mindful that some of these businesses are very leveraged they put in significant investment into developing technology and digital services. So um, an adverse environment and maybe some skittish investors could have uh, very negative consequences for some of the newer fintechs. Um, and even for well-established fintechs, accessing funding when you are a heavily leveraged business who's just invested a large amount in newer emerging technologies, it can be a little bit challenging. So um, we may see some changes in the market as a result of the COVID-19 crisis with um, some very promising fintech players potentially um, ending up in distress or, or being bought perhaps by some of the larger banks. Sorry, thanks Ruth, uh, just unmute myself. Uh, Kevin, I want to get your view from a Panergo perspective. How are you seeing things? Yeah, um, I mean, just to echo some of the sentiments that Ruth had, had expressed there, we would see this as both an opportunity and a threat. And it's been interesting over the last number of months. I mean, traditionally, we would have been on trains and planes meeting customers and prospects all over uh, the globe. And obviously, with COVID-19, you know, first of all, we need to ensure that all of our uh, staff were safe and secure. And we quickly moved to uh, working from home and, uh, you know, our employees being able to continue on those conversations with clients and prospects across the globe. I suppose speaking to the opportunity first, uh, where we fit in is around the client lifecycle management component that's very much driven around um, automating and digitizing customer journeys, improving the client experience, and driving operational and business efficiencies all in a, a regulatory compliant uh, solution. 
So with the move to uh, COVID-19 and an accelerant from a financial institution point of view to allow their customers remotely access their services in a more digital friendly uh, environment, whether that be over their uh, portal solutions or through their CRM solutions, we've seen organizations expedite those transformational uh, processes and particularly in some jurisdictions and regions that are starting to emerge uh, faster from this COVID-19 environment, particularly the likes of Australia. We're starting to see things open up again in Japan and in uh, Hong Kong. So they're moving ahead that little bit further than some other regions ar around the globe. I would also say that we do see some threats and some projects are being uh, put on hold for one reason or another. And it remains to be seen, you know, how the macroeconomic environment plays out over the next number of quarters. Um, you know, we are seeing, you know, um, this, this impact some organizations' earnings, and we do expect some, you know, volatility probably later on in the year and how this will affect some of those transformational uh, projects. But in the main, it, we've been exceptionally busy, both with existing customers and new customers looking to digitize and automate a lot of these uh, account opening processes, uh, David. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Michael, you probably have a broader perspective across uh, certainly the fintechs in, in Ireland. I'd be interested in your views and thoughts as well. Yeah, I, I'd have to strike a slightly more downbeat uh, note because I think in the short term, as Ruth has, has said there, I think that the normally disruption brought about by, say, technology or regulation is, is fertile ground for the fintechs. However, um, this is brought about by a bug or a virus, and it's resulted in a sort of a, an economy that's suffering, there's less spending by consumers, uh, business sentiment is pretty bad, and a lot of SMEs are struggling. And similarly with the banks, uh, the banks, I, I think, will be under pressure over the next few months. So investing in new technologies and partnering up with other firms is probably going to slip down the agenda. So I'm not quite as optimistic. Similar to... Ruth's experience with the investor community, I've spoken to a few of the uh, VC funds and a few angel investors, and they're being very picky about you know, what they're looking at. And some verticals, they're not just going to touch. So that's probably not good for, uh, for FinTech. Now, for some firms that are already kind of established, like Stripe and PayPal, I think it'll be good because they're well embedded into sort of the digital experience uh, that firms are moving towards. Uh, for some wealth tech firms as well, there's probably a little bit of optimism. Some firms like ID Pal and Tez, I see opportunity because um, they're well placed to provide digital uh, services uh, in, in ID that may well grow over the next while. An interesting group that we took on board recently was the Independent Funds Providers of Ireland. These are lenders into the SME world. And although their main business lines have, have suffered because of the downturn in the SME space, they are hoping to be able to play a role in the recovery program that they will be wheeled out at a European level and a national level. So they're you know, seeing opportunity in there. But I would be un unusual for me, slightly downbeat in the short term, but I think that maybe that the opportunities will be in the medium to long term. Yeah, 100%. Like the future is digital, but we're going to see a shake up here. Okay, um, on that somber news, I might move on to the next question, next topic, okay. actually. Um, so I think obviously fintechs have been at the heart of innovation. I think that's one of Jan's points, you know, not just here, but obviously across Europe and globally. Um, and we know that innovation drives competition and competition is good for customers. So, you know, it's really important, the, the role of in innovation. I guess my question, and, and maybe Kevin, you might start on this, is just do we have enough innovation going on in the Irish market today? And, you know, obviously in the context of looking forward to the future of fintechs, I guess, you know, have we got enough going on? Do we need more? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a huge amount of talent and brain power available within this space within uh, Ireland, David. And I th think Jan touched on it on a good point in his opening remarks is the importance of, you know, you might start off locally, but it's so important to have a global or a regional mindset from a scaling up. Uh, point of view, just the amount of uh, money that's required from a, an R&D point of view and just to keep up the pace with the changing environment that's out there is pretty onerous uh, today. So I don't think there's any shortage of that brain power and I think traditionally we've been quite global in our mindset as well to be able to, you know, obviously try and attract customers 
locally initially, but then, you know, go to further afield, whether it be to the US or mainland Europe or to the APAC region. And I think some of the support uh, organisations like Enterprise Ireland uh, have been critical for the likes of ourselves, particularly in the early days as we were looking to build the brand in new regions and new markets. They were absolutely critical stakeholders for us, David, in, in uh, building the business in other parts of the world. And uh, we started um, initially winning some quite large mandates in places like Canada and Australia and then working our way back closer to home here over the last a number of years and they were critical in, in, in that regard. So again, from my point of view, I don't think there's any shortage of innovation and brain power here locally, but it's just to keep an eye on, you know, you might build it locally, but to have that global uh, mindset and think about, you know, how can you scale up this business outside of Ireland as well. Easier said than done, I know, but uh, the aspirations and ambition must be there in order to be uh, successful. Thanks, Kevin. Might get your thoughts, Michael, as well uh, on this. What's your view? Yeah, we we yeah we we held a series of workshops actually last summer, in which we brought together sort of a slice of of industry, um, under the the fintech foresight group, which is a part of IFS 2025. And there was a bit of a view there, like yeah, that there isn't enough innovation going on, and and certainly the banks were called out maybe for not being as progressive. Now, interestingly, um, and, and to, to Jan's point there about the digital finance strategy, we've got some feedback recently from some bankers here who express some frustration at the fact that they, they feel they're being held back, in fact, by the regulations, whilst they appreciate that there needs to be regulations. It has stifled uh, the sort of the, the, the type of um, innovation that they'd like to be able to do. Um, so that has proven to be a, a sort of a bit of a challenge. One senior banker that uh, we spoke to recently, in fact, compared uh, open banking to a bit like a football pitch, defence, midfield and attack. And they felt very much that uh, their, their Irish banks are in defence mode at the moment. Now, on an optimistic note, I think towards the end of this year, they are beginning to look towards midfield and see, look, how can we now start to do some innovation? and take advantage of open banking and start to pull together you know more services for customers and indeed ultimately move into attack and start selling services to customers not of their bank but of, of others we think that's good for fintech when that happens but it's going to be a little bit uh, sort of longer yet given the the, the, the sort of COVID strike thing that we have going on at the moment we're trying also to explore the possibility of um bringing together the banks and fintechs in non-competitive areas like say reg tech or cyber where the possibility of maybe a utility style service that they could all use would would be um, a possibility and that's something we'll definitely be pushing this year through a series of uh, roundtables for planning thanks michael and we'll come back maybe in a moment to the, the broader regulatory kind of uh, perspective and, and support ruth your thoughts you're on mute ruth just on market size, one of the points that Jan made was about the fact that um, you know you need scale when you're doing very significant digital innovation, and you really have to look at the EU as an entire market. Now, today we look on a member state by member state basis when we're considering whether to exploit new markets, and that's reflected to an extent in in uh, financial regulation still. So it's just something to be mindful of. Smaller countries like Ireland are not particularly attractive markets if you're developing a very innovative product um, you will look to exploit the much larger markets with much larger um, customer base then and, and then you'll you'll probably list Ireland kind of towards the end of your expansion plan within the EU so we do still have the risk of this kind of two-speed expansion of new digital products um, and and the size of the Irish market is still kind of against us um, Kevin has mentioned the positive of it in the sense that we're extremely outward looking. So if you're an innovator in Ireland, you're automatically thinking about exporting your product, which is great. There is the opposite side to that, where maybe we won't have access to the same innovative products that other European countries are getting. Thanks, Ruth. Um, Michael, I just want to come back to this uh, regulatory perspective. I mean, do we think, I mean, obviously, you know, the regulatory environment is, as you were kind of mentioning there, a big, you know, um, uh, factor in terms of the pace, the type of innovation that can happen. Do you think that the kind of the broader regulatory supervisory environment is really accommodating for allowing innovation to happen? What, what's your what's your thinking? 
Yeah, this is a this is a hot topic, all right, that uh, gets discussed a lot. And I suppose from from the FPAI's perspective, I'd have to. My general sense is that the say in, in the context of the central bank here is that it's it's pretty well regarded by the the fintech community. Now, I, I hate to add that's a kind of a composite view that we would have built up from dealing directly with the central bank because we sit down with a with uh, Russell Burke and his team in the, uh, the Consumer Protection Directorate. And we sit down quarterly with, with our regulatory insights group and we share feedback from industry and they give the, us their perspective. It's a view based on discussions that we have with Enterprise Arms and the IDA. And as you know, the IDA would be dealing with firms that are very sensitive to the regulatory backdrop um, here in Ireland. And, and again, in general, the feedback is pretty positive. Um, we also deal a lot with the, the legal and the advisory firms, uh, many of whom are members of the FPAI, and they work with some of these fintech firms, uh, guiding them through the process. But, and, and a lot of the, the kind of terms I hear are knowledgeable and you know professional. And one Brexit firm told me that they were dealing with the central bank their last year under tight time pressure, and they were getting phone calls out of hours to say, "Hey, look, you know things are going well. If you can do the following three things, we think we can get you in over the line." Um, another firm told me that they found the central bank was easier to deal with than the FCA, where they had got a license. That would certainly book the trend or the, the viewpoint that, that the FCA has. Um, and another thing, on an international stage, the central bank is quite well regarded. And I was struck by comments passed recently by a, an executive of N26. He was being interviewed by Jess Kelly. And he said that, uh, you know, his firm was, was, was uh, authorized by Baffin, and that was a good thing. Well, across Europe, the central bank is seeing quite well, and it's 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 it shouldn't be the case, but it is regarded uh, in in more favourable terms than other jurisdictions, and that can be a help for firms coming here who see it as a good thing, and for Irish firms who are regulated by the central bank, knowing that that license can help them go across Europe. Now, just to give the other side of the coin, I have met with firms, and they've had pretty terrible um, uh, experiences dealing with the central bank. They found them you know slow and pedantic um but um to be fair to the central bank it may have been the case that that's that that uh, brexit had put pressure i'm sorry to use the b word but brexit had put pressure on them and so maybe they couldn't they weren't as responsive one thing and i'll end on this is that i'd love to see more of is the the work done by the innovation lab which is attempting to to reach out to the community and say hello this is what we do come to us first we'll try and help you before you ever get near the central bank and um, we did an event there last month with William Fry and um, Russell Burke and his colleague Helen Cosgrave did a wonderful session with us where they shared their experience of you know, dealing with the firms and where the pitfalls are and where things could be speeded up and where you know, mistakes have been made in the past that maybe they could learn from. So that's something we'd love to do more of and we're going to be doing more of that later on this year. Thanks, Michael. And uh, I might move on to you, Ruth, and maybe just broaden it out as well because we tend to focus on the regulators, the central bank, but we also have a data regulator as well. So there's multiple regulations, regulators as well to think about. Ruth, I'd be interested in your, your views as well. Yeah, um, well, on data regulation, I think we were regarded as being really, really over the top. And as things are evolving, people are starting to realize that the, the EU view on data protection wasn't that crazy after all, which is, which is positive. Um, I think when you first go to develop a new product and you do the data protection assessment, it, it seems absolutely crackers. But thinking about data in advance of developing new products, um, it just reflects this need for the customer to know that your service is reliable and safe and it's based on sound principles. So I think it has been a real struggle for us to get comfortable with the new data protection regime, but that's just the new normal. And if we want Conf if we want clients to have confidence in the products we're developing and marketing, it's just something we're going to have to do. So it's a hygiene factor. we got to live with it. That's it. Um, as regards financial regulation, back to Michael's point, the horizon scanning by member state competent authorities is very, very positive. So the central bank is doing it. Other regulators are doing it. They're not solely focused on what's within their regulatory sphere, but they're actually looking at new innovation and seeing how it impacts the industries um, that are regulated. So that's really, really good. Um, one of the observations I would make about EU regulation, financial services regulation, is that it's less flexible than it was before. So the example I would have is the loss of derogations. There was a, der a provision for a deroga derogation for small firms in the first payment services directive. I think we're going to see less of that. So our desire to have a single uniform 
regulatory regime across e the, the EU means that regulators actually have less flexibility and businesses have less, fle less flexibility in terms of how they apply and, and how they want to identify themselves. So that is going to be very, very challenging. Um, in, and I do wonder, are we going to lose some of the kind of the opportunity to be more entrepreneurial and try new things because we are really now driven by centralized standard making in, to a very significant extent. Thanks, Ruth. Um, Kevin, clearly with Fenergo, you're a very global organization. Do you see a lot of kind of differences depending on the part of the world that you're on in terms of kind of regulatory support for innovation? Um, not, not so much differences, but, you know, just the critical uh, stakeholders for us and critical partners for us in different jurisdictions that we're operating in, David, and we find them all to be very reasonable in their approach. And obviously, they have a critical job to do to protect the consumer and provide stability to the various different marketplaces. But, you know, there's lots of good best practices that, you know, we could potentially leverage here locally as well from stuff that we see via the HKMA in Hong Kong, OSPE in Canada, and the Royal Commission in Australia. More recently, we worked with a regulator in the, in the Middle East to deliver the first um, industry-wide AML and KYC utility across their financial services environment. And that was one of its first of its kind uh, globally and it was mandated by the local uh, central bank uh, that initiative so they were a critical uh, partner david in helping transform the financial services community in that country and um, you know we we see we see the regulator as being a critical component and a stakeholder in that regard i mean if you look at some of the large financial institutions you know that sort of some may be struggling with legacy solutions and trying to adapt new technologies to transform digitally. Um, we've seen the regulator being you know, very helpful to some of these firms, uh, particularly in, in markets like Australia and Hong Kong and in Japan, where we operate today, David. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I might ask Jan to, to rejoin us because we've got a couple of questions from the audience that I want to kind of raise now, if that's OK. And in a moment, I might just come back to each of the panel members and maybe just get a concluding thought, a concluding thought around kind of the, the, the future of fintech. Um, so, but uh, one of the, sorry, first question I just want to pick up on was, there was a question here around elaborating on defense mode. I think, Michael, you might have raised that particular kind of phrase, defense mode. Was it you that raised that phrase in defense mode? Yeah, but that was me. <laughs> <laughs> What did you mean? <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, just it's probably just reflecting a degree of frustration, I think, that some of the banks um, um are expressing. And it came through recently in the we put out a, a paper or an invitation to member firms to contribute to the digital finance strategy. And a few of the banks did mention that they, they kind of want to be more more um innovative. But that the weight of regulation and dealing with legacy systems has made that difficult. And I think, I mean, it's one thing to hear banks saying that, and people might be dismissive, but if banks find the regulation, you know, is sort of too burdensome, it'll be the same for the fintechs in due course when they get to a certain scale. The other thing that came through as well was from the, some of the smaller firms who, I mean, we all wedded to the notion that the, the regulation should be even and apply equally to the entire union and to all of the same activities. But for smaller firms, you know, facing the same regulation that say AIB faces is there, there, there needs to be I think a bit of flexibility built in there especially for a small firm that doesn't have many customers or doesn't have a huge you know line of product uh, there, there needs to be some um, I think uh, slack cut for firms like that. Thanks Michael and yeah one of the questions that's just come in from the audience is um, saying that there's a lot of focus on data privacy and GDPR uh, particularly when it comes to kind of new COVID-19 solutions. Um, and some of those solutions not being compliant. Um, fintechs can be a little light on sticking to the data rules themselves. Uh, and I guess the broader question is, how will this affect new innovations? Is there an open dialogue with the relative data protection body? So I guess it would be interesting in your view from a European Commission perspective, how do you kind of get that balance? We've touched on it as well. You know, it's, it's the balance between the, 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 the data protection regulations, but trying to facilitate innovation of smaller firms as well, you know, trying to get that balance right. 
Yeah, th thanks very much. Actually, very interesting uh, debate and very interesting also to hear a bit what the what the market feeling in uh, in, in in Dublin is uh, on on uh, on many uh, many things. Uh, actually, I, I mean, I would fully be aware and share also the view that, of course, short term, uh, let's say the current situation is, is is quite a challenge, especially for smaller companies. Uh, so that that's that I would uh, fully fully share that. Uh, view. Um, maybe indeed. Uh, let me start off with that with the question you mentioned, David, and then I would maybe comment if I don't, if I can, on a couple of other points which were made from the panelists, uh, also uh, towards uh, the European perspective. Um, I think on on GDPR, um, yes, it is not. Uh, I, I understand that this is not uh, what you prefer uh, doing as a business. But uh, I think we've had by now enough cases that will show that, uh, I mean, if you don't, if you're not uh, cautious on this side, whether there is regulation or not, sooner or later it, it, it haunts you back because the, the, the customer confidence will, will suffer. So um, it is in a way an investment which, which uh, unfortunately everybody has, has to make. I think one, one thing we are, so what we're trying from the European side, we're trying to, to facilitate this and uh, to make uh, to make it work easier. And one thing, for example, to see as we are now having the innovation hubs uh, uh, and also sandboxes in some of the uh, in many of the national uh, regulators, whether we cannot indeed uh, link the data protection authorities to that as well and and uh, and make sure that there's more more guidance. Um, I think what we're really seeing as well is that uh, let's say in the beginning. There were many big questions. I think as we are going our way forward, I mean, practical solutions are being worked out. And actually, it turns out that the GDPR is, is not as, let's say, inflexible uh, as, as uh, maybe some, even some data protection people have thought initially. So, so we are kind of hopeful that we, we can find pragmatic solutions on many uh, of the issues. Of course, the, the one-off adjustment is, is a big one, has been a big one, is still a big one. Uh, but uh, we, we hope that in, in the end the balance will be right. In any event, as always, we will actually uh, regularly review the legislation. I think we've just published the first report uh, uh, this week, so that's definitely a process which will be uh, ongoing. Um, maybe uh, there was a general point uh, made about the uh, inflexibility of the European rules and uh, also proportionality, uh, also broader, also on the financial regulation. Um, I would I would have two comments on that. Uh, so um, I mean we we are coming from a situation where before we had very much principle based uh, let's say directives around. Uh, now the problem is that uh, then the scaling up becomes a problem because it's not that the national regulators would just apply also principle based regulation rules, but they would all fill out uh, let's say the principles with their own uh, specific rules. And in that sense, basically, in the end, as a firm, you're worse off because basically you need, uh, you still need to comply with detailed rules, but with 27 rather than one. So I, I don't think that going back to principles-based European rules is the right way forward. Um, there's, however, a second, a different set of issues, which is indeed the question of proportionality and treating uh, risks as they are. Large risks uh, need to be more regulated than smaller ones. And I think that's something which we are we're actually trying to embed more and more also in the European rules. If you look at the at the, the banking uh, the latest wave of banking capital rules, actually we uh, we we have quite a lot of uh, specific rules targeted at the small innovators. Um, the only thing is that, of course, you also always have to see what what are the issues where where people really face uh, very concrete uh, compliance stuff, and then you need to find real solutions on that. And I think we'll apply the same thing as we now, for example, uh, kind of uh, developing common rules on operational resilience and, and cyber. It's very clear that, uh, I mean, we need to have a very strong proportionality uh, kind of element uh, because uh, otherwise, I mean, we'll overload the small ones and we'll underregulate uh, the, the big ones. So I think we are more and more moving in that direction, but I think it needs to be a, I mean, there needs to be a common discussion on, on what is big and what is small and what are the right rules, uh, so that basically in the end, then firms in the end don't don't face 27 different ways of applying this, this good principle. Um, uh, maybe to uh, one other point, which uh, I think Michael also mentioned indeed, uh, uh, let's say the broader obstacles which European regulation is, is, is uh, presenting. Uh, and I mean, I agree very much with uh, uh, that, that this is partially the, the, the case and we are indeed, uh, that's one of the, our issues which we are consulting on and actually looking at, well, what are the obstacles which are which are there and which we need to tackle? Um, 
the 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 one you mentioned on data actually and uh, and uh, I, I think data bsd2 you were referring to as well other matters is of course a very interesting one because let's say what some see as an obstacle others see as an opportunity so i think that's more it's not a question of let's say uh, uh, obstacles or not but it's more a question do you get the balance right in a way and i think that's what we what we're trying to work out in practice indeed to have a, to get the balance right um, I mean, from our side, we would strongly defend uh, the, uh, the the idea that uh, uh, there is no way back from from uh, let's say a more open uh, financial system and and uh, something uh, a system built on data use and open finance. Uh, and in that sense, basically, just uh, let's say thinking well, PSD two was maybe an accident, and we just need to kind of get back to it to the old world will not work. I think I think we need to find the right way uh, to basically to make sure that in this new data world we have a balance of rights and, uh, and obligations on all sides, and, and need a level playing field between all actors, and make sure that everybody is properly regulated. Um, but uh, we also need, I think, if we can. If our, the, the function and the effect of our rules is every now and then to gently push, uh, let's say, the firms actually to maybe uh, try to, to see what opportunities also this new data, uh, let's say, world can, can bring for them. I think that is probably what we would also intend to, uh, intend to, to, uh, to achieve because there are a lot of opportunities for everybody. I mean, I think you mentioned some of them for the banking sector, insurance, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. And uh, what I would not like, uh, I have to say, I mean, we are very open. Uh, but what I would not like is if those opportunities are uh, used by everybody else but our banking or uh, insurance sector. That, that's something I would not like to see. That, that's why kind of some gentle, let's say, uh, uh, support of, uh, let's say, encouragement in that direction is maybe uh, something which we, which we actually want to, uh, want to do and, and, and achieve. But we're very much open on the discussion about where does the balance lie, how do we ensure the level playing field in this, in this, uh, in this way. Thanks, Jan. Um, just maybe we're down to our last kind of 60 seconds here. I might just get a very quick, like one or two word concluding thought that each of our panelists might need to leave with the audience. So Ruth, I might just start with you just very quickly. Last thought. Well, I suppose we were pretty gloomy about the impact of COVID mm -hmm. on fintech businesses. But one thing I would say is this move towards digital is really, it's, it's playing to our strengths. So I'm based out in Kilorgland in County Kerry, um, very, very far from any of my customers. And we've been providing our services digitally, digitally on a non-face-to-face -face basis since we basically began service. Um, so we have this strength, we have this experience in Ireland, and we're really good at cross-border service provision. Um, and I think this is probably our time to embrace that. Thanks, Ruth. Kevin, maybe just very quickly, and Michael to follow. Fair. Very quickly, just you know, I'm positive on this, David. Um, you know, think think globally, um, start locally, uh, and um, you know, I do think, as Jan said, you know, that the, a lot of these solutions are adoptable across multiple segments and verticals on the financial services side. Thanks, Kevin. Michael, final word to you. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, uh, yeah, and it's great, uh, Jan, to, to hear the, the comments that you're making there. We, we've engaged very positively this year with the digital action uh, or the digital finance plan, and it's great to see some of the themes that you've that you've obviously picked up on. And we are really looking forward to to doing more work uh, through that channel and uh, hopefully turning Ireland and Europe into a great place for fintech. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> so let me just wrap up by saying thank you to Brian and the BPFI for facilitating this. Thanks to Jan for a great keynote and thanks to Ruth, Kevin and Michael for your contribution on the panels. That was great. Thank you. Great discussion. And just to remind people, we have the second series at the same time next week, same day, Wednesday next week, one o'clock as well on digital banking. So thanks, everybody. I uh, hope you got some value out of that and enjoyed it. Cheers. Thanks.